We move on to our second keynote today, and this is with uh, uh, the quite extraordinary Dale Vince, the founder of Ecotricity, talking about green entrepreneurialism. He's having an extraordinary time as a serial maverick green entrepreneur, founder of the pioneering green energy firm Ecotricity, owner of Forest Green Rovers with its vegan values throughout, and self-described as a traveler, eco-warrior, and incidental businessman who has spent his life in pursuit of another way to live. From enemy of the state, one of his phrases, to green energy tycoon, from outsider to climate champion for the UN, here is Dale Vince. Dale, good morning. Yeah, morning, thanks for the intro. Yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Okay, so tell us what that, uh, the skull and crossbones symbol is on there. Is that the, uh, the Sea Shepherd um, symbol? Yeah, that, that's the insignia of Sea Shepherd. Yeah, I'm a uh, patron of them, been a supporter of those for quite a long time. And um, they're also involved up at Forest Green as well. They're kind of like our official charity partner. Nice. Um, you say in your book, and by the way, I, I will give you this plug straight away. Uh, we've used the expression, the future is unwritten. This book certainly isn't unwritten. I'd, uh, I'd very much recommend it. Manifesto from Dale, um, how a maverick entrepreneur took on British energy and won. Uh, it's, it's an incredible story. But you say in there about um, uh, Sea Shepherd, they're, they're perhaps less well known. So perhaps just to briefly explain what they are and why they do what they do. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're massively more well known now than they were, let's say, five years ago when um, subsequently they got onto Sky with a series called Whale Wars. But when I first bumped into them about 10 years ago, they had one ship and they were in the South Atlantic every year trying to prevent the Japanese whaling fleet from killing whales. They did it single handedly. And I bumped into them through a Guardian article. They were running out of fuel and I got in touch and said, can I help? And uh, it kind of sprang from there, my interest and involvement with them. And now they've got, uh, I don't even know how many boats they've got, but they say it's the largest private Navy in the world and they're protecting sea life probably on five or six different fronts globally all at the same time. It's quite an amazing thing. And, and their founder, Paul Watson, is a really amazing guy. He's been doing this for like ever. If I could uh, just give a quick signal to our team, our marketing team, if you could uh, tweet and stick something on LinkedIn, linking to Sea uh, Shepherd, that would be, you know, just interesting. We are here to be a platform to help share interesting views and ideas. Dale, I want to, we talked earlier with Chris Anderson about Eureka Moments, he's talking about Elon Musk. You actually had uh, what you described as your moment of epiphany uh, in the winter of 1991. Talk us through that moment when you parked on a hill just a few miles away near Stroud. Yeah, I'd spent uh, the previous decade, more or less, living on the road in, in a variety of different things. And uh, as that decade progressed, I, I kind of moved into renewable energy to power my life. I started to dabble in uh, small windmills, some old train batteries from a scrapyard, and I kind of put things together. That's how I lived, very much making the stuff that I lived in and drove around in. And I was powering my life with a small windmill. I parked on a hill outside Stroud and knew it was windy because I was connected in that way to, to the environment because it powered me. And uh, I saw the first wind farm built in Cornwall. It was 1991. I popped down, had a chat to the farmer, and I was just inspired by the size of these machines and the possibility that actually the small scale stuff that I was using to power my life could be done at a bigger scale. And, uh, and I thought to myself right then, the epiphany was I could spend another 10 years living my own low impact lifestyle or I could drop back in and try and build a big windmill on the hill I was living on to try and make a bigger difference. And that's what I chose to do. But most people don't have that as sort of positive alternatives, either the low impact lifestyle or build a windmill. <laughs> but, uh, uh, what were you like as a character then? What, what, you know, your, your, your friends, your loved ones and so on. How did, how did that moment we talked before about the sort of obsession sometimes with entrepreneurs, how, were you, how did you marshal that within the lifestyle you were living to, to start to create something which became a business? Oh, I just I just went at it. Actually, I'm a very single minded individual. Um, in this particular case, I tried to find out everything I could about wind energy, about the technology of the turbines. And the first thing I discovered was that I needed to measure the wind. I, I needed resource analysis on the hill I was living on. That required a 40 meter tower with an anemometer and a wind vane and a data logger. Uh, I didn't have the money to buy a tower, so I made one, put it up myself. Uh, and started collecting wind. And then I discovered I needed, well, I knew that I needed planning permission. So I explored that process. In parallel, explored the process of a grid connection, uh, raising finance, while at the same time exploring technology still. So kind of a lot of things happened in parallel. It took five years uh, to learn everything in all of these different departments and to get the permissions and consents required to build the first windmill. And um, 
That was Friday the 13th of December, 1996, is a day that I remember very well. So it took five years of dedication, a lot of obstacles, an awful lot of uh, people and organizations standing in the way, and, and a huge learning curve, which I really enjoyed. Um, you talk about the, the learning curve, and again, we've, we've touched on this several times. Um, beginning in 91, that's the pre-internet era. It's unimaginable to anyone who's uh, born <laughs> subsequently. So how, how were you learning? Were you, I don't know, going to, going to libraries? Where did you marshal information? Yeah, I mean, I, I found a magazine, um, Wind Power Monthly. Uh, there was a lot of information in that. There were some conferences for the, uh, the Just Getting Going British Wind Energy Association. And that was like the preserve of academics and, and hippies. It, was, uh, it is now a, a, a global business, wind energy, but back then it wasn't. And so I'd go to those conferences, meet other people, talk to them. I took a, I think I took a one-week course at Imperial College in wind energy as well uh, that was that just become available and so it's about piecing it all together and talking to people and learning from other people and, and that kind of stuff as you say pre-internet pre the mobile phone as well i mean these are kind of you know hard times to imagine hard times right. yes it's almost as, as richard godfrey was talking about trying to imagine the unimaginable trying to imagine backwards to that time and how we navigated i mean god knows what we mm -hmm. did but just in that little vignette you've you've you know you've illustrated a point that Dimo Dimov was making about the relationship with academia and businesses that of course there's great resources that course you did at imperial or, or or wherever i want to take you back to your you know this is partly your, your overall story one back to the the mindset point um your life as a traveler until this point um both reflected and, and in some ways indicated that you were an out, outside the conventional flow. How much of that was a benefit to you as you developed your business interests? And how much was it a hindrance in how you were regarded by, you know, the far more mainstream people? I think, uh, firstly, I would say I don't feel that I have a business interest. Um, I have an environment interest and I use business as a tool to deliver that. That's an important point for me. I'm not yeah. about uh, business for the sake of business. Uh, I would say my character has been uh, a benefit to me all of my life. It's also caused me to have conflict. Uh, it's a two-edged sword that, that seems unavoidable. Living on the road itself, I would say, was a great experience because it made me so self-reliant uh, in practical terms. In uh, you know, I, I did my own engineering, welding, mechanics, plumbing, uh, all that kind of stuff. But also. Um, emotionally self-reliant as well, which I, I probably naturally am, but it certainly gave me an awful lot of confidence uh, that I could do pretty much what it is I wanted to do. And so when I entered the world of business in the early 90s, uh, you know, I think it was it was a doddle, actually. You know, <laughs> I, I, felt, I felt like it was a walk in the park. And metaphorically, I always remember living on muddy sites was quite it was quite hard to move around. Uh, you know, you had to have big boots on and you were weighed down by the mud and stuff. And whenever I stepped into town and walked on concrete and tarmac, it was easy and I could walk so much more easily. And I think that's almost a metaphor for my life on the road than moving into the world of business. It was just easy. It was just easy. And that um, uh, that sense of resilience that you mentioned, this sort of a, a, emotional um, strength, essentially, of course, has been one of your you know, key characteristics, you've been very clear in what you're seeking to do, the idealism, which, you know, that classic thing that yesterday's heresies can become today's orthodoxies. Do you feel as though, frankly, you know, your time has come now, that your idealism and thinking is, is just rapidly moving into the mainstream? Yeah, I think so. I think the, the time has come definitely for the ideas that I've been pursuing for a long time, uh, starting with green energy, you know, um, back in the 90s, didn't even exist as a product that you could buy. And now it's a kind of global staple of all energy markets. Wind energy has gone mainstream, as has solar. Uh, we've introduced green gas to the country as well. And that's, I think, going to go mainstream. It's a that's a different issue. Uh, we started building an electric car in 2008, um, pre-Tesla and got it on the road in 2010. Then we built the highway, then uh, the, the electric highway, national charging network, I think the first in the world. And, and our work has been about energy transport and food. So in energy, you can see that's become absolutely mainstream. It's the fastest growing form of energy in the world uh, every year for so many years. And it's the answer, a big part of the answer to the zero carbon problem, electrifying transport through cars primarily, but the rest is coming, buses, trucks, trains, it's all coming, even planes, and then food as well, promoting a plant-based diet. I think the last three years, we've seen an incredible rise in the popularity of a plant-based diet and compelling reasons for doing that. 
so yeah, I would say, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, yeah, just to sum up, I would say, yeah, absolutely. These these three core ideas, energy transport and food, they are the key to zero carbon living and more sustainability. And I would say they've all become mainstream. Um, do, you, do you agree with the idea that um, this, this pandemic has made us, you know, this brush with mortality or, or reset of our values has actually <laughs> helps accelerate that, that broad thinking you've talked about, that this great pause has actually triggered action, or is it simply, you know, we're going to revert to norm fairly soon and the long march continues, but hasn't really been affected by the pandemic? I don't think we can say yet which one it is. There's no doubt that people are talking about uh, both, um, hoping for the former, fearing the latter. Uh, I'm in that camp. I do think an awful lot of people have been questioning their lives, how they live them, the pursuit of work and commuting to work and that kind of stuff above the work-life balance. I think that's a very positive thing and it helps bleed over into bigger picture issues. I think the fact that we need to tackle the climate crisis has become increasingly evident as the years have progressed. The uh, virus crisis itself has, I think, reminded us of our own mortality and the fragility of our presence here on earth actually you know we are not in control to the degree that we tend to think that we are and i think that's a very helpful thing do you think the, the sorry i was going to say that we've also found unprecedented sums of money to fight <laughs> this existential threat 400 billion pounds we've spent in 12 months in our country that's more than 10 years of a zero carbon budget for our uh, our country and we were told before the pandemic uh, repeatedly that it was unaffordable to get to zero carbon but in one year we've just spent 10 years of that budget the money is there when we perceive the threat to be real and immediate yeah so in that respect you're, you're gesturing towards it but in that respect it's it's trying to persuade to articulate that the 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 existential threat of of climate change is if not on a par, but needs to be addressed in the same way that uh, this pandemic has been through central government action. That's, uh, you, you, you support that? Absolutely. I would say that the climate crisis or threat from the climate crisis is far bigger than the virus, far bigger. There's no vaccine for it. There's no social distancing that will save us. Our environment will become hostile to life on an enduring basis if we fail to get to grips with it. It's far bigger than the virus. I want to come back to the, the entrepreneurial point, and I wondered if, uh, if you feel that, uh, you know, being, being a West Country person, the West Country business, that the West Country itself has either the, the benefit of sort of brand West Country of the, uh, the cooler, more ecological, uh, more thoughtful world, and that's something I would, I would want to believe, but also has got this sort of zeal for new ideas, new business and so on. Do you think you've benefited from being, as well as contributed, benefited from being West Country based? Um, I don't, actually. So there's a short answer. <laughs> we'll go on to another one. Don't worry. You don't like that. I'll, I'll think of something else. Uh, let's, let's talk. I, I want to talk, uh, talk in more formal business terms. And I, I fully understand the point you're making that you, you, don't, uh, you don't wish to be, you don't see yourself as a businessman per se. It's the iteration to get your ideas in action, of course. But I want to talk about this mainstreaming point that typically mainstreaming makes things normative. I just wondered if scale is the sort of enemy of entrepreneurial zeal it's quite difficult to keep up that zeal as you build how have you managed to balance that well i guess from our perspective um we like to see scale and and big players follow in behind us when they pick up the ideas that we're uh, to a degree pioneering uh, that's a good thing because there are two ways to make change in the world in my opinion one is to do it yourself and the other is to be a catalyst by showing other people that what you believe and what you're doing makes sense and works, then other people will join you and then more gets done. So I think being a catalyst, uh, you, we can be a bigger agent for change. So our history of um, innovation in energy, transport and food has been followed by other bigger players. Most recently, we sold the electric highway to yeah. GridServe and Hitachi, for example. Um, and we reckoned at that point that it was time to get out of the electric charging game because we'd done our hard work. We began 10 years ago when there were no charging points for electric cars. There were virtually no cars on the road. And in the same way, we built a nemesis before you could buy a car in the world. And once we got it on the road, we could see the big car companies coming and said, this is not the space for us. Let's build the infrastructure. Um, here this year, we've said, let's, let's now move on from the infrastructure and do something else. So I don't see it as a conflict when things become mainstream and they come, become big business. I, I see that as essential. That's how we get the environment outcome that we need. 
You'll be familiar with this as a, as a concept, and, and it's quite clear from how you talk, how you, I mean, virtually everything about you. But the perhaps less for you, but for others, is there a danger that uh, that success or scale or whatever actually sort of takes away some of the sort of uh, the, I don't know the, the founding spikinesses or the rough edges or the, the the zeal in the first place that you sell out, not you, but uh, but others. Do you, do you how, how do you guard against that? How would you advise others to guard against it? I don't think you can guard against it because it, it sounds like something that just happens and it, it must depend on context. Mm. Um, but what we've found is that there are other frontiers that we need to push as we move out of one thing because it comes mainstream. We see a better value in our time and energy being spent somewhere else, uh, pushing innovation because we we do things without a business case and most people don't have that uh, ability. Uh, I mean, they could have if they wanted to, but they don't. But we have that. We don't answer to shareholders. We're a not-for-dividend company, which is how we self-describe. It's not a legal status, but we don't pay dividends. We put all of our money back into the work that we do. And we we simply do the things that we think need doing, with or without a business case to do them. And I don't see us running out of runway for that for a little while yet. Somewhere in your book, and, uh, and I'm afraid I, I actually can't, I didn't make a note when I read it, uh, you used an expression that, um, you know, you've got this great, great cool idea and no idea of how you're going to fund it. And you were just unabashed. It does, it's not a factor at all. How, how do you get funding for, for some of your, you know, perhaps larger scale projects? I think uh, I've been fortunate insofar as our 20 odd year journey as Ecotricity has has seen us become of a size where we can self-fund the things that we think are important. So the stuff I mentioned where we don't have a business case, we have a history of doing that stuff that we self-fund from our, our energy business, which is about 90% of our group. We're also a football club. We make primary school dinners. Uh, we make diamonds from the atmosphere. Um, we've got a bunch of stuff in R&D. You know, we've got a lot going on, but we're still about 90% an energy company uh, where we, we make money to pursue these other innovations. And the, the joining up theme of all of this is about sustainability, the pursuit of the other thing in my background, a greener Britain. It's, it's brilliant how you just, uh, you know, through the line, we make diamonds from the atmosphere. Oh, yeah, it doesn't everyone. Um, and uh, spo spoiler alert at uh, the epilogue, and I did get through to it, uh, of your book, this book here, look at that. Um, is exactly about the Sky Diamonds uh, uh, innovation process. Can you just briefly explain, because it's, it's one of those conceptual mind blurs, I suspect, for people listening. Yeah, the story of it goes back about 10 years, probably. And I was thinking about geoengineering as a concept, which you know, your, your viewers may or may not be familiar with. But it's the idea of making uh, large scale changes around the world to take carbon out of the atmosphere, whether it's through seeding clouds or, or the oceans or something like that. And I was thinking about geoengineering and you know, what might be the best way to do that and realize it's only half the battle getting the carbon out of the atmosphere. You then have to lock it up into a permanent form or, or you haven't completed the job led me to the simple thought, what's the most permanent form of carbon that we know of? It's a diamond. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could do that, take carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into a diamond? Uh, we started pursuing that as an R&D project about seven years ago. We launched it last November, and we're probably um, launching the retail product in um, <clears throat> September this year. But what we've created in that seven year journey is, I think, a 21st century industrial process. It's a first because the air that we put back into the atmosphere is cleaner than the air that we take out. And this is how modern processes need to be. Our ingredient list is the wind, the sun, the rain, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's exactly it. So it's a, an incredibly benign, sustainable process. And by do, we, we set out to do this thinking it was a great way to lock up carbon, but actually the amount of carbon in a diamond is relatively small. What we found, though, was that the avoided carbon from diamond mining is relatively huge. You have to dig 1,100 tons of rock to make a fifth of a gram of diamond, for example. Um, and there's all sorts of other impacts, you know, 4,000 litres of water, half a tonne of greenhouse gas, not to mention the social impacts as well. So when we launched Sky Diamond, we launched it with the rather bold uh, claim or aim of ending diamond mining, saying that we don't need to dig diamonds out of the ground now because we can dig them out of the sky. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's about it. That's the story of sky diamonds. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, th throw it in there, sky diamonds. I think you called it climate bling at one point in the, in the book. A um, few questions um, from, from some of those watching. Tamara, who I think maybe the Tamara who runs uh, 
uh, a green energy consultancy. What do you see as the single biggest barrier for SMEs accelerating the move to a sustainable business model? Um, mindset, I guess, is one thing. You know, you just got to got to really want to do it. And if you really want to do it, then nothing will stop you. That's what I've found. I think economics are always an issue, but the technology is getting cheaper and, and actually it's fast becoming a place where it's more economic to be sustainable than not. And then I'm going to give you a third one, which is the government. They have to change the rules of our economy because at the moment we pay higher taxes for low carbon things than we do for high carbon things. And that doesn't make any sense. Do you, do you lobby government yourself? Mm, no. <laughs> oh, you're, you're not a shy retiring violet. It's not for that reason, is it? Because you just don't think it would be effective? Yeah. Or is it you not know, your bag? About lobbying. It's not my bag. It's something about lobbying that I don't like, that I don't right. think is right, that the people with the access get to be heard and the people without the access don't. You know, it's not something I want to spend any of my life doing, actually. Yeah. So I don't. Fair. Um, a question from Rick de Mowbray. Um, is the entrepreneurial world inclusive to all and diverse? And if not, how do we change that? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know um, because, you know, I, although I am an entrepreneur, presumably by definition, I didn't choose <laughs> to be. I just do the things I, you know, I want to do. So I, I don't know much about the world of uh, entrepreneurs and, and how people get into it and whether it's inclusive or not. I, I think generally I'd say the world is not inclusive enough and we need more diversity and more equality. But you can see that's a battle raging in our country and around the world, you know, through these so-called culture wars that are being stoked up by our government now, you know. Uh, there's been a bit of a kickback, I would say, against greater equality and diversity and tolerance, and we have to get through that um, in the next few years, I think. Question also from uh, Rick Gordon-Brown of EIP, from whom we heard earlier. Um, is it actually possible for the UK to generate all its required energy from the sun, wind and rain? And of course, we hope the answer is yes, because it's a windy place surrounded by water. Um, but are there other methods of green energy generation you think should be investigated further and invested in? Yeah, wind, sun and sea is how we see green electricity being made. And the UK could power itself many times over. We've done a study, there's four times what we need for onshore wind alone. There's eight times what we need for solar alone, not competing for, uh, f with food for, for land. So it's, it's non-food producing land. Uh, and then you've got offshore wind and then you've got waves. So, you know, uh, I'm gonna hazard a guess 20 times over we're capable of producing. So that's not a problem. We did a study into marginal grassland to make gas to power ourselves. Uh, to replace the fossil gas that we use now. And we found that there's enough marginal grassland, again, not competing for food production, it's about all 28 million homes in Britain. So <clears throat> simple answer is yes, and that's, that's the detailed answer. There are other forms like geothermal. We're involved in a project in Cornwall uh, to do that. And that brings a really interesting form of renewable energy into the mix. It's constantly on. It's not something that fluctuates with the weather. And that's one of the big uh, drawbacks. It's not as big as it's made out to be, but it's one of the big drawbacks of having a 100% renewable energy powered grid. Geothermal is part of the answer. Tidal lagoons are part of the answer because it's a very controllable form of renewable energy. Grid scale storage of all kinds of types like gravity, like batteries, all kinds of types will be part of the mix along with the smart grid. Uh, so incredibly doable, and that's in my book, Chapter 13, is the manifesto, really, for how we get to zero carbon. The manifesto, Chapter 13, the whole thing is a manifesto, essentially. It's uh, the provenance of your thinking and the execution of your thinking, and what truly matters. Um, you gave a, a, a fantastic one-word answer to a, a far too long question for me earlier, which Anna has picked up. Uh, she said, I, I wonder why Dale didn't feel he benefited from the Southwest. So he didn't quite say that, but I think that was in that way. It'd be good to hear. <laughs> Don't think we'll be too offended. What more can the Southwest be doing? No, look, I, I love it here. Uh, I just happened to land uh, accidentally in Stroud and have, you know, this epiphany on the hill. Uh, I think Stroud has a reputation for being a green place. Um, I, I think sometimes that's a bit overestimated, but it is actually greener than a lot of places. I think too often we we try to um, we try to give special attributes to the place that we live or the communities that we live within. And I honestly don't think that I benefited in the way that you described from being in the Southwest, but that's not to say I don't think the Southwest is a great place. Right. Very good. Um, dare I say, and you probably won't like this, that's, that's almost a, a political answer. And I wondered, given how, you know, in one way or another, you're proselytizing, campaigning, advocating, and of course, doing. Um, you talk in the book at one point about uh, you know, the support which uh, Forest Green Rovers and your, your organizations are given to the Labour Party. 
Have you ever considered standing for public office? Would that be just so anathema to you that, you know, get out of town, don't even ask me the question? <laughs> yeah, I used to think about it, um, think about politics as a way to bring change and used to think exactly that. It would be uh, a waste of my life, actually. I used to think that the, the best way was to um, pursue these ideas through business, to show that they work as as a business. And I think, you know, that's that's come to pass now. We've got the technology, the economic uh, an existential imperative to deploy it. Um, and, you know, people increasingly want to see action on this front. Businesses are picking that up. They're producing things that help people live a lower impact lifestyle. And there's a great positive feedback loop because take, for example, plant-based food. The more it's made available uh, in, in more different places, the more people buy it, the more is made available because businesses feel there's a market for it. So I'd say that there's a great snowball rolling in terms of business and people in this direction. And what we're missing now is a government that gets it, a government that uses the three big levers of government, taxes, subsidies and regulations to change the playing field because at the moment it's skewed in favour of fossil fuels and the old way of doing things, which are driving multiple crises, not just the climate crisis loss of habitat, uh, wildlife extinction, and of course the human health crises itself, there are many of those, uh, one through diet and the other through pandemics like um, the one we're still living within, which is caused by, uh, sorry, it's a zoonotic virus. There are about 40 in the world, three quarters of them come from intensive animal farming. We cause this kind of problem through our diet, which also drives wildlife to extinction. Um, and, and makes us actually unhealthy in other ways as well. You know, the rise of diabetes, heart problems, cancers, and that kind of stuff. The link to animal products is very clear. So we've got these multiple overlapping crises. Uh, we, we have all of the answers, two things, stop burning fossil fuels, stop eating animals. Uh, we have a government that says we need to get to zero carbon by 2050, but isn't doing anything about that. You know, we pay 20% VAT on solar panels for our homes right now. We pay 5% if we want to burn coal. You know, how does that make sense when we've got a zero carbon target by 2050? Dale, are you absolutely sure you shouldn't be lobbying? Because that's, <laughs> I, I'm there, I disagree. I mean, whether I, you know, brilliant. Um, you, you, you are, you were a voice in the wilderness. You're absolutely a voice in, in, the, in the mainstream now. You have that, that platform which you are seizing. I did just want to come back to, to one point. We've not really talked much about Forest Green Rovers, which I guess is, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a, initially a more of a passion project. I don't know. It's an exemplar football club. It's been recognised by UEFA. You, uh, you've been, you know, recognised uh, internationally for the strength of sustainability, the stadium built of wood, vegan diets for the team and fans and so on. Clearly there was resistance. You talk about the council initially, the resistance, but I'm wondering all different ways. When it comes to resistance, when you have that zeal, you want something to happen, how do you persuade people to come with your vision? I've got two answers, really. Uh, one is I'm very Borg-like, so for any Star Trek fans, the Borg are an alien <laughs> species, whoever, my favourite saying is resistance is futile. So if there's something that I want to do, that's how I feel about it, but actually, uh, I do go about persuading people. So at Forest Green Rovers, for example, what we did was we, we took our fans on a journey. We explained not just what the changes were going to be, but why we were making them. And we found that as we as we showed the why, people got it uh, you know, considerably. A great example was when we took dairy milk um, off the menu. It was the last thing we did, our last step to veganism. And, and I remember some, some fans coming up to me and saying, why? Why can't we have milk there? And, and I said, do you know how it's made? Uh, and I explained that to them and they were shocked and horrified. Um, and I think that's what's missing for most people for us to make the changes that we need to make. We have to understand the implications of the things that we're eating, uh, how factory farms work, how milk is made, the abuse of animals that goes into that, how unhealthy it is and the impact it has on the climate. When you put these facts in front of people, then I think uh, more likely than not, people will make the right choice. Well, Dale, uh, thank you so much for your time this morning to the entrepreneurs and others watching this. If we're talking about, which I mentioned at the beginning, having success on your own terms, this is a man who has defined his success in a particular way, and he's absolutely having it his, on his own terms. For Dale Vince, uh, for Ecotricity, for Forest Green Rovers, the Sea Spiracy uh, uh, executive producer, multiple other areas of activity. Thank you very much. And I'll give it again, because I, 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 I rate it highly. Please, you know, look out for that book. Look out for Dale's other ventures, of course, as well. And thank you very much this morning. Dale Vince, thank My you. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.